very blessed to say that Father Bill Marquis has joined us this week. And he'll be, with us, he'll be with us on retreat as well, so we're really excited about it, Father. But I would like to invite you up, and he is going to speak to us on a very important point of, of something that's going on through the church today. And I don't even know how to pronounce it, but Father will pronounce it for you. It's... Um, it's a document sent out by Pope Francis, and uh, it's caused a lot of fury in, in the church because it was talking about blessings of same-sex situations. But he's going to explain it to us today and calm our hearts. Is that right, Father? I, I will try. Okay, so come on up. I always take these controversial documents, you know, so I pray really hard for the, the protection of the Lord. Can you all hear me well? So if I'm moving around, you can still hear me okay? Okay, good. Well, let's begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Lord God, we ask you to look kindly upon all of us gathered here today. We thank you for gathering us together to prepare for this uh, retreat weekend uh, where you will bless us and you will encourage us and you will give us strength and guidance on our journey uh, to you. I ask you to bless all of us here, bless our families and our friends, bless those who are sick and ill, and please, Lord, guide us in all that we do. Send your spirit upon us so that we may know your will and that we may do your will in joy. And we ask all of this through Christ our oh Lord. Amen. Amen. Now that's a blessing. And I give that blessing to my students before every class, whether they want it or not. And, you know, I never hear any of them say, no, stop, stop. They love the blessing because they know that the blessings of God gives power. And um, when Angie asked me, I don't know, a month or two ago, whenever it was, to speak on this, on this document, I had no idea what she was talking about. I didn't even know about this document. It's called Fidulis Supplicans. Fidulis Supplicans. And so I said, well, I, I don't know. Let me, let me think about it. Let me pray about it. And I, I heard all this uproar about this document. So I said to Angie, I, I don't want to go through, I don't want to step into this big controversy. Uh, but then, believe it or not, I went online, <laughs> I went online and I found this document, this podcast called God's Splaining. God's Splaining. You've probably heard of it, maybe not. It's done by Dominicans. And I knew these two Dominicans. They taught with me at Providence College. And one of them is the editor of our Sunday Visitor. The other one's a professor of philosophy at Catholic University. And I knew them, so I thought, oh, I can't wait to hear them talk about this document. And so when I listened to them, I thought, oh, typical Dominican. I just love the way they explained it. They did such a nice job. So I encourage all of you, uh, if you, if you're interested, you don't have to, but if you're interested to go and listen to it, it's God explaining on Fidulis Suplicans, and you know I can give you the I guess the, the the web page after after the talk is over. They do a great job, and so then I contacted. Well, I didn't I didn't contact Angie yet because I was still a little unsure of myself until. We got this call from the prior, it's like, you know, the guy in charge of our community at Providence College, that we're going to have a meeting of all the Dominicans on campus, about 35 of us, to discuss this document. And I thought, wow, this is really stirring up a lot of interest. And of course, in the meantime, I spoke with people and they said, you won't believe what they're saying. And the Pope is telling priests to go bless homosexual marriages and all of this stuff. So I, I thought, well, I'm going to go listen to the Dominicans, see what they have to say, listen to my friars at Providence College, see what they have to say. And uh, then I contacted Angie and said, sure, now I think I'm ready to talk about it. Um, it's actually not a bad document, but you should know 
that this, this document, if you do this supplicant, you can get it online, it's free, is addressed to priests. This is for priests. I mean, laity can, can read it if they like, it's not a secret, but this is like a little handbook on how to deal with people who come up to us priests and say, can you bless our civil homosexual marriage? Can you do it? And so this is a guidebook on how to do that. And so it stirred a lot of controversy. So we're going to do it the right way today. Uh, if you have any questions, of course, I'll take all of your questions. I'll do my best to answer them. And I will tell you the truth. So you're not going to get any nonsense here. Uh, as we begin our discussion, of, we're going to start with blessings and what they are, what they're all about. And one of the beauties of this document is that it expands on the idea of what a blessing is. And it says, well, we know this, us who, are, who do theology know that God's plan for us is, is not, it's not changing but the explanation of God's plan is evolving over time. So over time, the church learns more about what God's plan is for us. For example, uh, we did, uh, in, in the days of Jesus, St. Paul and the apostles did not know how to deal with nuclear war. You know, just didn't know. And, but now we do. And so God's plan is not changing, but the explanation of God's plan is evolving as different things um, happen in life. And so the church had not said much about blessings. I gave a talk on blessings a couple of years ago, uh, which I learned a lot about blessings. As a matter of fact, the talk I gave to you at that time changed my life. It changed my life because in studying uh, the little that there was about blessings, I learned so much more, and I came to appreciate the power of blessings. As a priest, we give blessings all the time, and so we, it, 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 we, we don't tend to take it as seriously as we should. So when Angie asked me to do this, I thank you for doing that, because it changed me. And from that day forward, I made sure um, that I blessed my students regularly, and, and myself and others. And I took it so much more seriously. And so things, uh, the blessing itself doesn't evolve, but the explanation of what is a blessing has evolved. And this document says that. It gives more explanations about what blessings are. Now, before we even get into the blessings, let's put, let's put your conscience to rest. We're going to put this to rest right now. Where the church makes it clear, and it says it right here in the document, therefore, rites and prayers that could create confusion about what is a marriage, which is, and it states it, the exclusive, stable, indissoluble union between a biological man and a biological woman naturally open to the generation of children and what contradicts this is not admissible. All right, so let's get that out of the way. Anybody on the internet or saying that now we can, we can bless these unions is not admissible and the church's doctrine on this point remains Firm. So we begin with that. The theology of marriage has not changed. So, but we can still bless people. That we can do. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So, and, I, and as I said, if any of you have a question or anything, just raise your hand and I will ask it. If we can't answer it during the meeting, I'll answer it after the meeting. But we'll take all of your questions because that's my job. <laughs> yes, the, uh, yeah, the, uh, the answer to your point, we may not bless a homosexual union. We may not do it. The church does not have the power to do that. And I will tell you why. Okay. Uh, now, blessing people, yeah. 
I can bless people. And so I'll explain to you uh, the details. And then I'll open it up for questions, okay? So if you want to take a note and, you know, sort of put it down on a pad of paper, I'd be happy to, you know, answer your questions because we want to take care of that today. Um, so what is a blessing? And that's what this is really all about, is what are blessings? Uh, blessings, they go back to the Old Testament, and we have lots of examples of it. For example, um, we have... Um, an ancient Jewish blessing that I shared with the parish here at St. Elizabeth Seton uh, uh, that uh, fathers give over their children and it says some, there's a number of different forms of this blessing but it looks like this on Friday night uh, during the Jewish uh, meal on the Sabbath fathers would often bless their children and would say something like this May God bless you and protect you. May God show his favor and be gracious to you. And may God show his kindness and grant you peace. So that's one form of the blessing that fathers would pray over their children. And so this is an ancient Jewish blessing. Uh, we also know that Jesus uh, would bless the children. Children were brought to Jesus and he would bless them. And so a blessing, in essence, are words, kind words, good words, spoken over another person or over an object. So it's, it's words, good words, pleasant words, uh, spoken over somebody or over a, an object. So Jesus blessed, fathers bless. And we bless. Now, in these blessings, these kind words spoken, we can um, bless God. And we're going to see in tomorrow's reading on the presentation, remember the presentation as the feast for tomorrow, where uh, Jesus, uh, excuse me, Mary and Joseph brought Jesus to the temple uh, to offer sacrifices and give him to the Lord. And Simeon took the child and blessed God. He said, bless God, I thank you, Lord that you have given me the opportunity to see the, uh, the salvation of Israel. And so Simeon blessed God. And so it's a kind word, a good word spoken before God. And so we can bless God, we can bless each other, and uh, we have done this in the past. Now, in a blessing, there's two parts, all right? It's typical Dominican, you know, two parts. One part is called the descending character of the blessing. And this is in the document, so you can go read this. It's the descending character of the blessing where we say, Lord, I ask you to bless my students, to keep them safe, to help them in their work, to help me in my work, and to protect us all from every evil. That's called a descending character where we call God's power down upon ourselves or on our children. That's one part of the blessing. A second blessing, a second part of the blessing is called the ascending character. And the ascending character is us asking the Lord for a blessing or praising the Lord for some blessing or good thing that he has done. And so blessings have two parts. They come, they come from us, in a sense, they're ascending, asking the Lord to guide us and help us and bless us and keep us. And then there's the descending where we're calling down the power of God on ourselves or on others. And so that's what a blessing is. Now this document goes on to talk about this in more detail. And a blessing is considered to be a sacramental. Open it up for questions about sacramentals. Anybody know the difference between sacramental and a sacrament? Yeah. 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 What, what is good? Well, Go sacramental on. is something that points you to your faith and the powers and the devotion of the user, much like a blessed candle, blessed salt, or blessed water. And then a sacrament is one of the seven sacraments that we partake in in the sacramental graces of the Catholic Church. 
Okay, good. Not bad. That's pretty good. Anybody want to build on that? Anybody want to add to that? Oh, no, no, no. The outward sign of the inward transformation. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah, that's that's exactly what it is by definition. So isn't the sacramental that too? No. Ah, you're right. You're right. There's a difference. Anybody else? Okay, a uh, sacrament, a sacrament gives grace. All right, so it gives grace. So if I, when I say, when, when the priest speaks the words during Mass, uh, this is my body, this is my blood, okay? The priest doesn't do it, God does it, but for some reason, God has decided that we would say the words. And so, through the words of the priest and the proper intention and a few other things, that are required, ordination and the like. God, through the word, transforms the bread and wine, body, blood of Christ. Uh, when I say, I absolve you from all your sins, a lot of people don't really believe that. <laughs> they, don't, they don't believe me, you know. Uh, I, I just had the another day, it didn't happen here, it happened somewhere else, uh, where somebody came to confession, I gave absolution, person left, then came back and said, wait a minute, I forgot something. <laughs> and I said, that's all right, come on in. So the person told me what he or she forgot. And so I, I gave absolution again. But I, when it was over, I said, you, you didn't really have to do that. He said, well, why not? I forgot. I says, I know you might have forgotten, but when I say, you're absolved of all your sins, I really mean it. <laughs> Even the ones that you forgot are absolved. You're done. It's over. Um, but it's okay. We understand that. So when they come back in, we give them another absolution, another blessing, and, and send them on their way. But these, this is the power of God. And it's, it's irrelevant. It doesn't matter the condition of the priest. I mean, I would hate to say it, but even if I was in a mortal state of mortal sin, even if I was, when I say, your sins are forgiven, they're forgiven regardless of the state of the priest. And the Lord does that because He loves you. He's not going to let me interfere with His saving of your soul. So, it's okay, Bill, you say the words, but regardless of your condition, I am saving my people. So, we are instruments of God and imperfect instruments, but God works through those words and forgives you your sins. And that's what a sacrament does. I asked my professor in seminary way back in the day, and I said, so is that it? It's like the seven. And the professor correctly said, no, no. Uh, there are other times that give grace, but we know these for sure. So we know this, these will definitely give you grace. Uh, you may get it, you know, playing golf on a Sunday morning. God may, may give you grace through that. But it's kind of iffy. <laughs> but this is not iffy. So these seven sacraments definitely give grace. A sacramental is different. Not too different, uh, but kind of different. The sacramental prepares us. It prepares the soul, prepares the mind. It prepares the heart to receive God's grace in the sacraments or any place else. A perfect example of that is what Angie and you all did, I don't know, 10 minutes ago, when you sang your songs. Singing the songs are sac is, is a sacramental. It prepares the soul. It kind of softens the ground to be ready to receive God's grace, uh, either through the talk or, in any, or through your fellowship, whatever it might be. And that's what a sacramental is, what a sacramental does. And some good examples of sacramental, there's lots of them. Uh, can you give me an example of, of a sacramental less salt, that you less salt, do? Less salt. Less salt. Less Holy salt. water. Holy water, right? Scapular. Scapular, right, exactly. That, I'm going to come back to that in a moment, in, in about two minutes. Scapulars. This is a scapular right here. Yeah. Scapular is an apron. <laughs> Is what it is, and this one's dirty. I, I, don't know it's I picked it up. I picked it up in the rectory, so I don't know. Maybe they maybe they used it as an apron, but the scapula is an apron. It's an apron that the monks used to wear 
and it became the symbol of, of, of a monk, like the hood. The hood that I have here, you know, it's just that. It's just I wore it to go get my stuff because I forgot it in my car. So it's just a hood. But it became a symbol of, of monastic life because the monks had them because they were always cold. And so they needed a hood, they needed, they needed an apron, and all of that. They all took on religious significance. But we know that this sacramental, which is only an apron, protects me from evil. And, it, and so if you get scapulars you can buy, they protect you from evil as well. More on that in a moment. Um, things that are good sacramentals uh, do a good job of preparing us to receive God's word. A good sacramental would be a good homily. You get a good homily, uh, it kind of gets you ready to receive the Eucharist or God's grace in any other way. Uh, good music, music during church, a beautiful church. Uh, this morning, I was not in church, but I felt like I was in church. You know, I was I was in my brother's bathroom because he, him, and his wife has bedroom, and that's where I'm staying. And so I was in the bathroom shaving, and <laughs> on the counter is you know, statue of Mary. What she's doing in his bathroom, I don't know. <laughs> statue of Mary with rosaries, and then there's little other statues, and then on the mirror is a picture of Jesus stuck there, you know, with tape. I thought, man, you know, it's like going to church in here. <laughs> you know, sacramentals. Sacramentals, they prepare us to receive the Lord. I had to, I had to smile. Uh, when, uh, over every door in his house is at least one crucifix on the doors, crosses everywhere. These are sacramentals. So a beautiful church, a home filled with crucifixes and rosaries and statues, they prepare us to receive the blessings from the Lord. And this document talks about that. Matter of fact, let me see, it says in the evolving sacramentals, uh, I had noticed it before I came in here, and of course I cannot see it right now. But one of the things this one says is that sacramentals give power. Ah, here it is on page 7. It says, soon it turns out that it's talking about the evolution of what of their knowledge, our knowledge of what blessings do. And as it turns out, blessings possess a special power. It's the special power of God, which accompanies those who receive it throughout their lives and disposes man's, our hearts, to be changed by God. That's what a sacramental does. It is power. And so, as I said, uh, crucifixes, objects, holy objects, are given power to protect you from evil. And uh, they protect us and they dispose our hearts to be converted by God. And that's what, that's what a blessing is really all about, disposes us to uh, be changed by God. And so, there's a couple of points I wanted to talk to you a little bit about. So what do, the, what do these blessings do? They prepare us to receive God's grace. They prepare us to be changed. They get us ready. They prepare the ground. And so they get us ready to receive God's grace. And grace is the power of the Holy Spirit working in our lives. Second, they conform us. Blessings conform the soul to God's will. They conform you. They start to change you so that you can accept. And this is very important in our blessings coming up in a moment. They begin to conform our will to the will of God so that we want to do what God wants us to do. We want to do it. It isn't just obeying a rule, but something we want to do. Third, it restrains the power of evil in our lives. So a blessing, and we bless ourselves, we are restraining the power of evil that can affect us. 
I think I shared this with you before, maybe in church or a mass. Uh, I was having dinner with my friend and his wife. They're, they're Russian and Greek Orthodox. Now they're, they're both Orthodox, so they could marry. But the, the Greeks don't like it too much when they marry Roman Catholics. But we're still friends. This is in both Orthodox, Greek, and Russian. They get married, and they just had a baby. And I, I noticed I was having dinner, and so just before the mother fed the little girl, you know, she took her two fingers. That's how the Greeks do it. You know, we we do this. They're more like this. You know, they're less that way. And she blessed the little girl and then gave her some food. I said, what was that? Well, back in the day, uh, when she was an atheist, her parents are atheists, they still are atheists, uh, she grew up as an atheist in Russia. My friend is from California here, San Jose, and uh, he is uh, Greek Orthodox, and he was never an atheist, but she was, and she, her parents were atheists, but get this, her grandmother, who had the faith before communism stepped in, uh, took care of the little girl, because the mother and the father were both professors. One was in chemistry, the other one was in physics or something, and so they were, they were gone, working. So the grandmother took care of the little girl, and the grandmother, you know, would bless her. And we'd tell her about Jesus, which she forgot all that stuff. She forgot all that stuff, till later in life. These are sacramentals. No sacraments, but sacramentals. Later in life, when she was in her 20s, or 20s, I guess, she had a conversion experience. Uh, I've asked her about it. It's kind of vague. You know, people don't like to talk about their spiritual lives very much. And she says, yeah, I, I, I started to wonder about God. And so she came to a deep, deep, deep conversion of the Lord. And then she started going to the Russian Orthodox Church, which got opened recently, it's been reopened. She started going and her whole life was changed. And so she found this man who was a Greek Orthodox and they shared the same faith. They got married. and So remember that, those of you who are grandmothers, don't lose hope. Don't lose hope. We, we don't know how these things are going to go. And so she did the same thing to her daughter. <laughs> And so sometimes if I stay too long <laughs> over their house, you know, that she'll bring the little girl over to me. And so she says, you give her a blessing. So I do, I give her a little blessing. I do it my way, I don't, I don't do that. <laughs> I do it my way, the Roman way, and she, she'll take it. So blessings, they have power, and they protect us, and they restrain the power of evil. And this young mother knew that. So she blesses her child to protect her. And so the uh, so blessings uh, give us grace. They uh, protect us from evil. They restrain the power of evil. And God has given this authority or power to bless to his church. And we're all included in that in our own way, according to our state. And so this mother you know, does the little blessing, and so will you. You and I encourage you to bless everybody. As St. Paul said, bless and do not curse. So bless and be free with them. Bless, bless, bless everywhere you go. Bless your children. If they throw a fit, do it quietly. <laughs> you know, don't, don't start a fight. Don't make a blessing, you know, an issue of contention and fighting. Just do it quietly. The Lord hears, you know. The Lord hears your blessing. So bless and do not curse. And, and God has granted you and me the power to bless. One final thing before I go on to the actual document itself is the image of Jesus at the ascension. You know, in Luke's Gospel, I think it's chapter 24 at the very end, uh, when Jesus is speaking to his apostles and disciples, whoever was there, and he ascends into heaven. And the image is uh, Jesus is ascending, and as he's ascending in the gospel, he's blessing the people. And so remember that. As the Lord is in heaven, he is blessing all his people, all of them, whatever their state in life. Thank God for that. Because St. Paul and others teach us that while we were still sinners, God loved us and blessed us 
Now, sometimes uh, the blessing, and this is in the document as well, and it's strong, strong uh, Dominican teaching. I was glad to see it. That blessings are received according to the mode of the recipient, which means that I receive grace only insofar as I am open to it. So if I'm open to it, and that's why I say the greatest prayer you can say for yourselves is, Lord, open my heart so that I can receive all the blessings that you have to give. And that's what we want to do. We want to open our hearts so that we can receive all of God's blessings. Because we're the ones stopping it. <laughs> we're the ones who can only receive the grace according to our own condition in life. So, that's the first part of what blessings are and uh, what blessings are for. So then, the document, um, you do see a suplicant says in the, the little handbook, for priests, this is for priests, let's be clear on that, says that now, how do you apply this? Now, this is where the rubber meets the road, you know. How are you going to apply this in your day-to-day -day life? And so this is where it gets contentious, and this is where all the fighting is on, on, on social media and everywhere else. And so the document says beautifully, um, the document, or the, 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 yeah, the document asks us priests to show what it calls pastoral sensibility. <laughs> pastoral sensibility. Pastoral prudence. Pastoral sensitivity. So this is this is how it begins. Now that means you priests don't go out there and be mean and nasty and all of that. Just be nice. Be on your best behavior. Show some pastoral prudence and sensitivity. And now there are going to be people in what's called irregular situations. And so this is this is answered in another church document that I don't think I brought with me, but you can find it, it's out there. And the church document says this, there are three basic, um, um, what you would call, what is it called, irregularities that it's concerned about. The first irregularity is, is divorced and married. Now, divorce, you can get divorced, we don't like it, we'd like it to stay together, but sometimes it just doesn't work. No, divorce is fine, it's the remarriage part. So Catholics who are divorced and remarried, that's the first irregular situation. And so there's lots of those, right? My sister was one of those. So I'm sure you might have kids or relatives who are in these irregular situations. The second one surprised me and did not surprise me. The second one was Catholics living in polygamous marriages. And yeah, I know, I know, that's what I said. Really? I, I've been doing a little research on that. I, I come to find out that it's, it's getting to be the rage. Yeah, 20% of Americans agree with this. 20%? I mean, I wonder if, how they'd feel if their spouse was living in a polygamous relationship. And so in Africa, sub-Saharan Africa, it's a real, I knew that because I'd gone out to Kenya a number of times, and a lot of, uh, there were people, I think it's 10% of Christians in, in sub-Saharan Africa mm -hmm. uh, living in polygamous marriages. And, um, oh yeah, in Kenya, just made it legal. In 2015, they made it legal to have a polygamous relationship. So the church, I mean, we, we don't see much of it, although it's, as I said, it's getting popular. And I don't know why. I have no idea where that is coming from. Uh, it just seems to me that one's enough. <laughs> one, one is about all I think I could handle, and even that. Um, but can you imagine having that? So that was the second irregular situation. You didn't hear much about that, did you? No, no, that was a big surprise to me too. 
The third one was, of course, the homosexual, uh, living in a homosexual union. And so those are three irregular situations. And so um, how are we to deal with that as priests? Now we're to show pastoral sensitivity and pastoral sensitivity. And so I only have a very short part. See, I've been turning pages and pages and pages. But this is a part that is for us. It's very, very short. As I said a moment ago, we may not bless a union. So if, if there were two people standing in front of me saying, Father, uh, we are living in a homosexual relationship, and we would like your blessing, okay? But what do I do? So that's, a, that's a good question. That's a, that's a tough one. Because you want to be kind to them, and you don't want to be mean to them. You don't have to be nasty, but you have to say the truth. So the truth is what I said earlier. I may not bless your union. I may not bless your union. I'm sorry. I, and if you think that I am kidding, uh, my niece, I will say which one, came to me, said, Uncle Bill, I want you to marry me and so-and-so on the beach. And I said, so-and-so, I love you, and you are my niece, and I will see what I can do. So I went to a number of bishops in person. I was serving on one bishop's um, economic council. I was chair of his economic council for his whole diocese. I said, hi, bishop. I have, I have a question for you. And I thought, sure, I would get it because of my position. So I said, ah, oh, my niece is this wonderful person. I think she's free of all sin and all of this. She would like me to marry her on the beach. And the bishop said, I'm glad that you love your niece, that's a good thing. But he said, there is not, there's not one bishop in this country who will give you permission to do that. And he said, there's nothing personal, Bill, nothing at all. I love what you do and continue to work for me, but I cannot do that. I do not have the power to give them permission. So I went to another bishop. <laughs> I'm a good Catholic, you know. <laughs> I went to another bishop. And I got the same response. Uh, they said, no, we can't do it. So I went to my niece and I said, I love you. I really, really do. And man, I would do this in a second. But they will defrock me. They will take away my priesthood. Or my, they won't take away the priesthood. They'll take away my, my permission to serve. Like I could not give this talk without getting permission from the bishop's office first. Or serve on that retreat or anything else. I cannot do one thing without the bishop's permission. Explicit in writing. And I have it. I've got it in my car. It's right there. Never leave home without the bishop's permission in writing. But I do have it. Carry it with me. And she said, Uncle Bill, I don't want to get you in trouble. So we'll we'll just we'll just have mass in a nice church overlooking the ocean. Is that okay? And I said, yeah, it's fine with me. So I would do it. I really would. You know, you got you got to do what's right. If you're not going to do what's right, take off the habit and leave. You know, call it a day. That's it. Do what you got to do. And so I would not bless the union. However. Uh, I, I shared this with you already at the last meeting. You know, when I was at Our Lady of Guadalupe, um, I came out of the church, and um, I, did I, I told you this yes. story, right? Yes. Somebody, you know, tapped yes. me on the shoulder, tap, tap, tap. <laughs> and, you know, he, he gives me this stuff. He can't speak English. I don't speak, I don't speak Spanish, so. I thought he was trying to sell me something, whatever it was. And I said, no, 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 no. And then, turned around to walk away and he tapped me again. And so I, 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 I got it. I thought, okay, he wants a blessing, I blessed him. And then I turned around, walked away, and then I, right away, I, another tap on the shoulder. So all these people lined up. I was there for an hour. I blessed three, four, five groups at a time. They'd come up and uh, with their kids or friends or mothers or grandmothers, whatever, just a group, group, group for one solid hour. It, I don't know how many, a thousand, two thousand, it went way, way, way back. And then the, the group I was with took off. They just left, you know. <laughs> they continued the tour without me, so I missed, I missed all these talks. 
I did not ask them, are you in a polygamous union? <laughs> What's the state of your soul? You know? No. I said, come on in. And I blessed them. And uh, th we have permission to do that. And this is called spontaneous blessings. And in the document, it even talks about being on a pilgrimage. Somebody might come up to you and ask for a blessing, give it. But this is a personal blessing. It is not a right of marriage. The right of marriage is written up that we have to follow, and it has a special nuptial blessing. I may not give that nuptial blessing, except in the proper situation. I cannot give uh, couples living in um, you know, homosexual union, can't give that <coughs> nuptial blessing. But I can ask the Lord to guide them, which is what I usually do in a blessing. My kind of standard blessing is, you're all going to hear the same thing. You know, if I bless you, it's going to be, Lord, I ask you to open their hearts, uh, guide them in the ways of holiness, protect them from all evil, bring them into union with you, and grant them a nice, happy, joy-filled life. All right? You can say that for anybody whether they're in a good place or not so good place, regular or irregular. That's what the church means. And that you can say for anybody. And so, somebody stops me on the street, somebody stops me after Mass, I can give that blessing, but I may not give them uh, the nuptial blessing. Second, uh, the, the document's very careful. It says, you may build, you may not even insinuate that the blessing you're giving is a blessing of this union. You know, you can you can bless the people, but you cannot like, imply that this is a special blessing of this union. You can't even do that. So I even have to be careful like what I wear. I can't put a stole on or anything like that, unless I already have one. Another example of this is, and I'll end with this, and then I'll take your questions, um, is during Mass. You know, we, the priest almost always tells people, come on up for communion if you're in the, you know, in the, in the right state of grace. Uh, but if you're not, come on up, cross your arms, and the priest will give you a blessing. Mm -hmm. And so we do that. We're told to do that, and that's perfectly acceptable. Once again, I don't ask them, why, why are your arms crossed? I don't, I don't <laughs> do that. And I shouldn't do that. That would be extremely inappropriate behavior. My mother would really slap me. She would say, Bill, don't ask. It's none of your business between them and God. So they cross their arms. Who knows? Who knows what their condition is? You know, give them a blessing. May God fill you with his life and his goodness and his joy and maybe bring you into complete union with him, help you turn away from all sin, whatever is going on in your life, may God restore you to holiness and goodness so that you will be able to live in his happiness and joy forever. That's what the blessing is all about. And I guess you would call that maybe an ascending blessing, okay? I don't know, are there any questions now? I will take you. Oh, here they come. <laughs> now you've got to speak up. You really do. Go ahead. Okay, my question is that right after this uh, document came out, there was a picture of a priest back east with the stole on the rainbow stole, blessing a couple that were holding hands, and it looked in the church. Yeah. So to me, that was like, what is going on? Yeah. And then we had Father Bill Martin who was saying, Hallelujah! We're finally going to bless them. James, 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 James. And um, and so my question is that there's such ambiguity, and the the press is picking this up, and so it appears that these priests are not being told. This is not the way to do it. They are, it is to be done the way you said. I totally ag agree with that. But they're doing it the other way, and no one is saying. Well, you know, it's, it's really beautiful no. that you asked that question. I, I mean it sincerely, because um, this came up in God's explaining in that little video on YouTube, where um, 
I don't, I, the, the, the priests who are really good guys, the younger guys, but very, very good guys. I, I like young priests because, you know, they're not spoiled yet. You know? <laughs> they're still very, very good uh, in their priesthood. And, and they were saying, so, are there going to be abuses? And they both agreed and said, yeah, yeah, there are going to be abuses. God knows there's going to be abuses. What can I tell you? I'm not doing it. I'll tell you that. I don't think Father, I don't, I, I don't want to speak for Father Michael, but I'll bet you Father Michael would do it. I, I'm not, I, it, I cannot bless that. And if some priests do it, it's on them. I, don't know. I mean, that's all I can say. But I am not denying what you're saying. I, I know, I believe it. Yes. So what exactly, if anything, has changed? Did anything change, or nothing is it just changed. reiterating what already was? It, nothing changed. The only thing that changed was more <laughs> was said about what a blessing is. Yeah. And so, as I said earlier, because I wanted to make sure that was clear, I made a terrible mistake one time when I was teaching. I was teaching young Dominicans theology. Now I'm teaching economics, and that's probably why. <laughs> but I was talking about the evolving, the evolving theology of the church. Young Dominican raises his hand and says, the theology of the church is not evolving. The explanation of God is evolving. And so what changed is the explanation of what a blessing is. It expanded it and talked a little bit more. And you can read it. It's very, very, very edifying. So nothing changed that I'm aware of. Anyway. Uh, I know that as a, as a Christian, as a Catholic, one of the signs that we'll be able to tell that you really are, you'll know them by their love, one for another. So we are already, already know we're to love everybody, Absolutely. but to hate the sin. We're to love everyone. Absolutely. We can love kings and bums exactly That's the right. same. Right. And we're blessed already with the sunlight and the air around us and the earth God gave us. So I'm kind of um, wondering why the big hoopla about Blessings. We're already being blessed already. Why? If they're going to do that, I would say, okay, I understand. We love everybody and you want to know, grow more in the Lord, we bless you. Okay, why don't they say very clearly, we will always bless everybody, but we will never marry homosexuals in the Catholic Church. Never. Well, I think they did say that. Let me go back. I don't ever hear. I never hear it. Okay, maybe maybe it, maybe you haven't heard it. Maybe it hasn't been clear. But the church is. I I'm saying it. They're very soft. On I'm saying they don't it. Come out and say it. I'm saying it. I'm saying it right now that we are to love everyone to the best of our ability within our capacity to love as much as absolutely. We are to call God's blessing down upon everybody, regardless of their state in life, so that they will find union with God. But we cannot bless a union that is not in accordance with God's will. And the church has said this, we do not have that power. That's so. I don't know. Maybe after maybe after yes. I'm saying after mass, after, after I'm done talking, uh, we can I can talk to you more about it. But you're not wrong at all. Okay, we can I, talk I'm more. I'm just saying, does the Pope actually say that to the news so they will oh, pick no. it up? No. Who knows? Who knows what he's actually said to the news? <laughs> that I don't it's scary. know. Yes, go ahead. <laughs> why did this come out, and why is this a point of attention now, if it's always been? And my question, secondly, is, is, is it 
potentially because more homosexual couples are asking for this blessing? Because I find people, that people. <coughs> more unusual to just go up to a priest and ask for the Can you hear her? Yeah. yeah. Great, great, great question. I should have put this in my talk. I was supposed to put this in my talk and I, I forgot. All right. Having an elderly senior moment, is that what it's called? Um, the question is, uh, um, what was the question again? Why, why, why is there... Oh ah, yeah, why, why is the question even raised? It's because of some cardinals in Germany. It's a German issue. It's a European issue. It's a German issue. The, Ger the Germans have always been, I mean, I love Germans, okay, I'm French Canadian, and nothing can the Germans, love them, all my friends. Uh, they tend to be on the cutting edge, if you will, on the cusp of, of the church. And so they wanted uh, to, they wanted to see if they could get permission to bless homosexual or transgender marriages, or whatever they are, these marriages, and probably the same thing with polygamous and uh, um, married and divorced, or divorced and remarried. They probably wanted to give them blessings. And so the dubia, there were five dubia, and I think this was the second one. Uh, dubia is a doubt, a doubt about church's doctrine. And so Pope Francis answered it, but that wasn't enough. So he came up with this to, to reinforce it. It's in Europe. It's a European issue. And that comes up in God's plan when they talk about it. I'm sorry I didn't include that. I've got to go back here. I'll come back. Yes? Um, you said that a um, good homily is a sacramental and prepares you for God's blessings. Yep. Does a bad homily do the same thing? Well, it doesn't do it as well. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't do it as well. <laughs> You know, do you know, do you know, Vatican II, uh, in the um, evolving explanation, not theology, but the evolving explanation of the primary duty of the priest was, according to Vatican II, the primary duty of the priest was to preach. Now, that was huge, because all these priests were saying, well, I thought, saying the Mass. He said, no, you've got to prepare your homilies, priests. You've got work to do. I never forgot that, and my father never let me forget that either. <laughs> it's, so I don't know if I really feel that way. I think primary responsibility of the priests is, is to love God's people and to care for them and shepherd them. But a big part of that is certainly to prepare your homilies. I saw another hand over here. Yes? I, I can't hear, that's why I'm coming up. Yes? yes. All I want to say is that going on is in our church, I am horrified, okay? So I won't do everything. But I have to know that God is the one exposing everything. He will not have his house of prayer defiled. And that's what's happening right now. You see all this stuff, and it's a whole bunch of this and a whole bunch of that. God is exposing what has to be exposed. He's given us eyes and ears to hear. But we have to stay focused on Him. Amen. I have, I have too much work to do and uh, spend my life looking at everybody's sins. <laughs> I saw another hand go up over here. I have a question because when I had read it, and I remember the word couple was there, and I thought, I wonder why they had to put that in because, um, like you said, it's irregular unions, and, uh, and we're all sinners, and so it's not about, you know, people are not necessarily the state of grace when they receive the blessing, but that if they were individual blessings, then it seemed like that maybe wouldn't have caused so much um, uh, controversy over the whole thing. Why did they have to put the word couple? Mm -hmm. yeah. you know, because could, couldn't they just kind of left that out? And individually, yeah. people put forward their blessing, or like it could union. It would be, I, I stand up and cheer. You are preaching to the choir here. Um, I don't think they should have used that word. That's my personal opinion. I'm not the Pope, so 
uh, my personal opinion, and a lot of people have said that, and it comes up in God's planning. They said, why did they use the word couple? And the good Dominican priests just nodded their heads. They should have said individuals. Mm -hmm. I agree with you, but I'm not the Pope, so I know I'm being recorded, so I, I want to be able to come back and join you. <laughs> yes. I just want to thank you, Father, because my mom was not even one years old when I she is upset about this. And she says, why is the church doing that? Why is the docu document necessary? But you can even some of that. So I appreciate that. Good, good. Yeah, it's um, nothing, nothing has changed. It's just we're, we're in the middle of, the, of a big debate, and it's going to be resolved. As a matter of fact, at the very end of Fiducia Supplicans, this is what it says. I'm reading it to you. I'm quoting because I think it's very important. Uh, whoops. Uh, ah, okay. Number 41, it says, What has been said in this declaration, okay, every word, what has been said in this declaration, that's what this is. This is not like an infallible statement. This is just a declaration. Regarding the blessings of same-sex couples, is sufficient to guide the prudent and fatherly discernment of priests, ordained ministers. It includes deacons, so priests and deacons. This declaration, uh, what has been said here, the saints is sufficient to guide the prudent and fatherly discernment. So there is priestly discernment going on here. I mean, when somebody comes up to me, I gotta discern. And it's not, it would be nice if we had exactly everything. It's not that way. I've gotta make a choice. And in my mind, I have. Now we'll see what happens in the future, but guide the prudent and fatherly discernment of ordained ministers. Thus, <laughs> this is the point, Beyond the guidance provided here, no further responses should be expected. In other words, this is it. This is the end. So, get on with life. I, no more. So I'm thinking, thank God. <laughs> thank God. And um, so, nothing has changed. Tell your mother, you know, it, it, the priests are discerning. And we have examples already, and there will be more of them. Uh, you won't see it here. No, and I don't think you're going to see Dominicans. If you do, you let me know who they are. <laughs> okay, I just want to make sure everybody gets in. Okay, go ahead. So the blessing uh, will go to a couple or no. single? Single. 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 There could be two of them. You can have two of them. But the blessing is for each individual. And I want to say that you said the preaching is very important and that priests are not afraid to read chapter 1 of Romans and explain why that's rebellion. What's rebellious? And Chapter one of Romans, where they speak about homosexuality. Oh, oh, oh! Very oh. clear. They can preach that mm -hmm. and not have to skip over that chapter. Okay. That yeah. first chapter. Yeah. Yes, yeah, you gotta do it carefully, but yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And that's where the preaching should start. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Can you give us an example of a blessing that you would do to two homosexuals standing in front of you? I was thinking about that driving out here, and it started to rain. I thought, oh, stop thinking about it. <laughs> um, it's never happened to me in all of my years. And that's what the priest said in God's planning. They couldn't imagine a homosexual couple or a transgender couple, whatever, coming up to either one of them and asking them to give them a blessing. I mean, and it, could, it could happen. So let's... Let's take a possibility that it does. Um, I would have to tell them, uh, well, let's, let's go to another room and let's talk. I would explain to them that, you know, I cannot bless your union. And I would tell them, I have nothing to fear here. I said, 
I cannot bless this, this union, but I can bless each one of you, and I can ask the Lord to guide you and to help you. And then I would, I don't know if I would take them together. Taking together can, can lead, you know, right, because you're nodding. You know, you're right. Yeah. You put them together. Well, there's a picture, and they're holding hands, and he's yeah, got his yeah, right, right, you know, and they got their rings on, and, yes, and right. you know, it, you know, you can put your hand on their rings. Up. You know, I just don't think it's a good way to go. But I think it would be better to say, I can pray for each one of you, and I will pray that God fills you with everything, every single grace, and that you find your way to Him, and you grow in holiness, and you do it in a nice way, and then you do it with the other person. And so, they're, they're not stupid. They know that you're doing the best you can. And that's what my niece said to me, Uncle Bill, I don't want you to get in trouble. We just want to get married on the beach. And I said, so do I. And I, I would love you to get married on the beach. And I just can't do it. And they said, fine, cool, we'll, we'll do it somewhere else. So they see that you're trying. It's when you say, you know, get out, or, you know, you're, you know you're, you're living in sin and you're mean to them and all that, that's when you can really lose them. It's not Christ. Yeah. It's, not, it's not Christ. Yeah. It's not being Christ-like. Yeah. The, the woman in adultery, right? Yeah. We're all sinners. So we can't give permission, but we can do... I think we're about... Are we about done now? Yes. I'll take all of your questions, and we can always talk afterwards. Go ahead. Uh, you said something about the, um, the irregularity of uh, divorce and remarriage. Yes. And Without an annulment, yeah. Yeah, that, that would be one of the categories. So in other words, if I'm a Catholic, I married a young woman, and um, we get divorced. No problem yet, although we'd like to stay married. <coughs> and then I get married again without an annulment. Then I'm in an irregular situation. Mm -hmm. You get married again in the church, or you get married again in the church. You cannot get married anyway. again in the church. All you can do is what we call in theology attempt marriage. So if I were to say, let's go, you and I, you know, take off the habit, we go get married, it's an attempted marriage, it's not a real marriage. I'll see you later. <laughs> The first well then, uh, those are the details that get put into an annulment case. So if you're not married, it, in other words, if you married, let's say you're a Catholic, and you married a man, let's say who is a Catholic or not, either one, and you did it outside the Catholic Church without getting the okay from a priest, we don't recognize that. But that, you, that has to be discussed with a priest in an office, you know, where you go through all the details. And then, now, if, if you did something like that, that could be fixed pretty easily. You know, you come in, you say, okay, renew your vows. We'll do a quick annulment, and you're good to go. Get it blessed. That's not so bad. You know. Okay, but that's... Uh, all right, is that anything else? Is that good? All right. So let's have a little blessing. May Almighty God bless you and keep you. May He fill you all with His Holy Spirit. May He bring you into a holiness of life so that you may enjoy the happiness and joy that He has to give. May Almighty God bless each and every one of you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let us go in peace. was really perfect for us to have that understanding because there's so much going on in the news and so forth. But Father has his work cut out for him now. Um, he is going to, we're going to take him outside. Hopefully the rain will, will um, stop just a little bit for us. And he's going to bless every item. So he's got, he's going to bless a whole bunch of stuff for the retreat. And so, um, because they're all going to all these sacramentals. He's going to pray exorcism blessings on, on these gifts that you're going to be receiving at the retreat. So I'm excited about that. So if you, after he blesses everything, Father is willing to, um, to hear some confessions. And um, if you would like to do that.
Okay. Yes. Can I ask a question about the sacramental of blessed salt? The, the sacramental blessed salt? Yeah. He's going to pray a blessing on that. He's going to, and it will be a sac, it will be a sacramental, it always is, and, and he'll pray an exorcism blessing on it. So it will be a pure salt. It's to protect you from evil. So cooking with it? Yes. Mm -hmm. I cook with yeah. it and put it on your oh, yeah. table, shake it, and exactly. also sprinkle it around your home yep. or you know, your property. A lot of, a lot of uh, Mexicans will drink holy water. You know, it's very common. They have you know, big vats of holy water and they drink it. They don't yeah. do it here, but... So, yeah, that's yeah. fine. Yeah. It will protect you. Yes, that's, that's the point of less salt, to use it in that way. Mm -hmm. Okay.